Hello and welcome to the Curiosity and Consciousness podcast with me, Karen Maloney. I am your host and the intention of this podcast is to help us open our minds, get curious about ourselves and to raise our vibration and consciousness levels. Through these conversations, we hope that you will go on an inward journey to discover the truth of who you are and to become aware of your own energy and vibration. We have the power to consciously consciously create our lives but we need to wake up to this fact before we can begin the process and learn the key of self-responsibility. Check out the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Acast, Castbox or whatever platform you listen on and please like, subscribe and share the podcast, leave a review, leave a rating as this will help it to reach more people. Check out my website as well, Soul Power Light, www.soulpowerlight.com. Welcome, 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 everybody. It's me, Karen Maloney, and thanks for joining again for another episode. And if you missed last week's episode, we turned two over the weekend. So it is super exciting. I can't believe that the podcast is two years, but it's been an epic journey with so many incredible guests and so much learning. And as always, I just want to thank each and every one of you that has tuned in or shared an episode or reached out to me and told me how it has supported them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's continue the work and keep the conversations growing and reaching more and more people. So Another brilliant conversation for today and my guest today is Simone Gisandi and Simone is a registered holistic nutritionist, holistic health coach, regenerative detoxification specialist as well as a certified hypnotherapist. Because everyone's biochemical and energetic makeup is as unique as a snowflake, Simone uses a personalized and holistic approach not only to identify imbalances and the root causes of illness and disease for a person, but also to address these issues and to bring the body's system back into balance on all planes, physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually. She also works on educating, empowering and involving her clients when building a plan focused on restoring health, wellness and vitality. This is a brilliant conversation and it was so good to connect with Simone and hear about her journey and her work now that she does. But I suppose a lot of this conversation is centered around health and well-being and especially physical health and by all means as Simone shares in this conversation, she was the picture perfect box of health, for want of a better word, according to the Western health model. She had exemplary blood work. She was not overweight. She didn't smoke. She exercised five or six times a week. But yet she suffered a massive stroke in her early 30s. So a lot of this conversation as well, Simone shares how how you look in the external does not always actually equate to health on the inside. And that's where I think as well, sometimes the Western model is broken. We just seem to think if we hit the numbers like Simone did, well, that means we're the picture of health. And that wasn't the case in Simone's case and for many people. And she shares how once she started to take accountability for the fact that she had a part to play in her own illness, that she also could heal herself as well. And that's really the quest that came up for her because the Western medical model was not giving her any answers, was not tailoring any individual care to her. She was being treated the exact same as a person who would have had lots of different symptoms and for want of a better word a perfect candidate for a stroke so she went on her own research journey and that's how she started into her work now as well in regenerative detoxification which is a bit of a mouthful for me but it's super important work and it's really detoxing the body and helping it heal and get back to its optimum and in its state of balance again. And Simone shares how our bodies are always fighting for us to be healthy and to be in a state of homeostasis. That is our body intelligence. It is always inclined to lean towards healing, but we also have an active part to play in supporting our bodies in the best 
way possible as well. So super important conversation, really interesting. And Simone also shares some things that helped her as well on her recovery journey. And to hear her now and to hear her so full of life and joy and vitality, you would not think that in her early 30s, she had such a debilitating stroke. So enjoy this conversation, take from it what you will. And you can find out more on Simone's work on her website, Simone Gisondi, that's G-I-S-O-N-D-I dot com. But as as always, I will have everything linked on the show notes on my website, soulpowerlight.com and click the podcast section. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining and tuning in for another episode. Super excited for today's conversation as well. And my guest is Simone Gisondi. So hopefully I said that right. And first of all, welcome, Simone. <laughs> Yes, you actually said that. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. Happy to be here and very honored to participate. Yeah. Um, what really fascinated me and kind of attracted me to your work when I came across you was mm -hmm. the regenerative detoxification and holistic cancer practitioner. So they really fascinated me. You do a multitude of things as well and incredible work. So I'd love for you maybe to just describe your work, first of all, and maybe what led you to it? Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll start with that latter part. What mm -hmm. led me to it is, uh, I guess, my own journey towards healing. I I suffered from a pretty significant stroke back in 2011. Oh, wow. um, and subsequent to that, it, it took me quite a bit of time to get myself back uh, to my own optimal and superior health. So it set me on a journey of learning what I need to do to actually heal myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the most important message that I have for everybody is that you have the power in your hands to heal yourself. And anybody from the outside that's trying to heal you is actually just there to guide you. But I found that the allopathic community actually led to to my detriment. So I was not getting better. I was actually getting worse. Mm -hmm. uh, so I decided that I'm going to take matters in my own hands. And I set on a journey of learning and educating myself to see exactly what is it that actually heals us. So that's how I got started. And uh, re yeah, so regenerative detoxification, actually, just as the name itself suggests, is, is there to regenerate. So it regenerates the cells, it regenerates the tissues. And as you can imagine, you know, with the, with the brain injury from the stroke, I had to regenerate that area of my brain that, that was affected. So this has been actually... Sort of, sort of the holy grail to to my healing. Mm. Um, so that is actually at the core of what I do in my line of work right now. And holistic cancer was actually as a result of my father actually suffered from cancer, and I don't say suffered from in the sense that he's gone. He's still very much alive. God Amazing. bless him. Yes, thank you. And uh, the same kind of approach. The 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 approach to healing sort of remains the same across the. I guess across the board, no matter what you're trying to heal and the body in its infinite wisdom takes what you give it as support and does what it needs to do and what it was programmed to do and what it is inclined to do. So the body is always inclined towards healing and towards mm -hmm. health uh, with that support from you is actually uh, it does what it does and you get back to 100 percent. And that has been my my experience that has been my father's experience and that has been the experience of the people that I actually work with so yeah it's been it's been such a blessing to learn to learn all this incredible I'm curious well you've mentioned the word but I'm curious to just see how you look back on that stroke now ah uh, uh, it depends if I'm going to look back on it from a spiritual perspective it was actually my biggest blessing mm. because it took me on this path of learning uh, what it takes to actually heal so it has been it's really invaluable what I've learned yeah. that about the power that we have to heal ourselves and I'm not just talking from anything significant like what I had a stroke and that's that's quite significant or anything like cancer but really anything mm -hmm. imbalanced hormones 
diabetes, even non-threatening, non-life-threatening yeah. things actually can be healed very easily. Fibromyalgia, lupus, anything autoimmune, all those things are that people actually just kind of manage. Mm-hmm. They get by and manage living with them. Even those things are actually very, uh, very easy to heal. And I know I'm not supposed to be using the word heal, but uh, it's not healing. And I want to make this clear. Healing is not something that somebody else does for you. Yeah. Healing is something that the body does for itself. Yeah. Uh, um, and all we do, uh, practitioners, uh, and I'm talking, I'm not just talking about people like myself that deal predominantly with the nutrition aspect and a lot of the mindset aspect, but energy workers, mm-hmm. energy practitioners, people like that, they're there to guide you, but ultimately it is the body and yourself that does the healing. So mm-hmm. by no means do I ever claim to heal anybody. Yeah, it's uh, it's just to show them what they need to do to support their body on its journey to healing. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I'm the same even in my own work and through my own experience. I'm like, oh, yeah. And I can't remember who said it. I think it was Dr. Bruce Lipton or one of those. But it's like Mm -hmm. the body heals the body. Nothing else can heal the body like that. Yes, we can have supports and guides, but ultimately the body heals the body like that is the innate wisdom and intelligence that our body holds. But when we're not taught how to work with the body, how to support it, how to help it to, well, detox and get back to that healing ability, you know, that's that's the shift. So I love what you have shared there and just something I just want to touch on that you mentioned as well before we dive deeper and when you had your stroke in 2011 and a stroke is is a really serious thing so it's so incredible Mm -hmm. that you know you've been on this healing journey and do this work now I wonder what was your prognosis at the time and you mentioned how allopathic medicine was actually making you worse so what was what was happening for you at the time? To be honest with you, and it's remained sort of a a mystery to the uh, medical community. I mean, through my healing journey, I kind of came to realize what I was doing wrong. And it's something that I sort of caused for myself. And Mm. one more other point that I wanted to make as an aside is that no disease ever falls out of the sky onto anybody's head. Uh, It's something that's created. And I know that I created that for myself. But the way that it was and the way that it unfolded was actually quite unusual because I was in my 30s, early 30s. And uh, yeah, very young, actually, and very athletic. Uh, I was a runner. I was in the gym about five, six times a week. I've always been into sports. I've always been athletic. I've always been all about movement. I'm not one of those people that likes to stagnate. So I didn't have any of the symptoms. I was not overweight, Mm -hmm. was not a smoker. I was not eating too much salt. I didn't have high blood pressure. If anything, actually, my blood pressure was quite low. So even the doctors were sort of scratching their heads as to how can this be? And how is it possible that somebody so young and so Mm -hmm. healthy, because by their standards, I was quite healthy. How can somebody like that have a stroke of all things? I mean, it's cardiovascular disease and it's not something that runs in my family. So it was um, it was quite the thing. Um, But looking back on it now, like I said, it was a huge blessing that it happened because it put me on this path and it helped me discover exactly what's at the heart of this and what caused it. How is it? Because if you if you look at any documented anything, they say that, like I just said, overweight, usually mm. like older, um, you know, people who are smokers, high blood pressure. And I did not check any of those mm. boxes. So it was really difficult for myself and for them to wrap their head around how can this be? So I got to learn exactly what was sort of at the heart of it after subsequent to everything. And what I meant by what happened with the allopathic community is that they have protocols that are not designed to help the individual, but they're they're sort of a catch-all approach. Mm. So they sort of approach whether I would have been a 67-year-old overweight woman who's a smoker and consumes high amounts of sodium, or whether I'm a 32-year-old runner with low blood pressure, if anything, they approach it the same way they have the same approaches to how they try to heal you they have the same protocols Uh, you take the same medication so they put me on the same medication as all other stroke patients and so that's what actually led to my detriment because I saw that I was not getting better Mm -hmm. I was actually getting worse I was not feeling well they the ambulance took me a second time when I finally got back to work after months of being off 
close to a year, actually. I was rushed to the hospital by one of my managers. Mm -hmm. So I could see that this was unfolding, that like I'm not getting better. And I wanted the, the desire was there for me to get better. I was terrified that I was going to leave my young kids without a mother. Uh, it was horrifying to me because I had these images of my children seeing me in a coffin while, you know, trying to bury me. So it was horrible, horrible things that, that went through my head. And I said, you know what, I have to he like sink or swim. So I knew that I had to find a way. And um, that's what was sort of my catalyst towards going to to learn what actually heals you. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as such a blessing and such a godsend, because right now I probably would still be in the dark about what people need to do to heal themselves had that not happened wow um thank you for sharing all that that is incredible mm -hmm. and for giving that context like you say of you know you were the picture of health for want of a better mm -hmm. word and again the the issue with the one size fits all you know, not the individualized care and how incredible it is as well and inspiring for you that you had that desire to own up and go, I'm not getting better because so many people have that fear of leaving the Western model because it's like, oh, well, this this is the holy grail. So that's really, really empowering. And I suppose then the, you ask the question yourself there, you know, what actually heals you? So what then did you start to do or how did regenerative detoxification come across your path? Well, the first the first step that I took was, uh, so I started doing research because I was off. Mm. Uh, and the worst part about such a thing, and, I, and I'm sure that anybody who suffers with anything like that can actually attest to this, you feel quite disempowered mm. uh, because what you're used to using, i.e. your body and your senses and all of that to actually carry you through life, when it's affected and you don't have full control and full use of those, you feel you feel that sense of I'm sick, I'm unable, mm -hmm. I'm not able to do this, I can't enjoy life fully. So I was quite frustrated because yeah, I didn't have full use of all of my all of my abilities that I had been yeah. kind of up to that point been used to using. But inside my head, I was fully functional. Like in my mind, it felt like I was trapped in a in a broken body kind of thing, so to speak. So I kind of, I knew how to do research because my mind was in there and I was able to do things. So I set on this journey of researching. So I was looking for people that had had strokes and it was quite limited because there weren't a lot of young people that had posted mm -hmm. anything at that time. There wasn't a lot of uh, information that I found that I could use. There was a lot of scientific stuff which is very jargon heavy yeah. but again it was just about the whole idea of the protocol being sort of applied across the board in the same way stroke is stroke whether it's a two-year-old or a 70 year old so um, I approached it that way but I think the first step that really set me free was accountability when mm -hmm. I finally took ownership of the fact that I did this to myself so I can heal it. Whereas mm -hmm. when I looked at it the other way, like this came from the outside. So it's somebody from the outside that has to heal me. It yeah. feels totally disempowered, totally disempowered. Wow. Yeah, that is, that's huge, you know, to, mm -hmm. to wake up to that accountability and that ownership. Um, because like you say, when you, when you do that, you can heal it because it's, it's yes. the reversing of what got you there in the first place. Reverse engineering. <laughs> yeah, um, because that's often, you know, and I, I, I even have friends who've had different health issues and like that, they'd normally be, you know, they're perceived as healthy and all these kind of things. But I love what you say as well, like illness or disease, it doesn't fall from the sky. Like we don't just yep, wake up in the morning. True. Our body mm -hmm. is not just giving up on us. Our body is calling for help. And usually there's whispers and nudges and then they become screams and roars because we, we don't tune in. We don't listen. So then how did you begin to reverse engineer your post stroke? Oh, my post stroke care. Yes, I'm so glad you said what you said, because it's so true uh, that your body actually fights for you with everything it has every mm. single day and every hour and every minute. And when it's not feeling so good or when things are at a point where it needs to call for help, it actually does so. So you get that through symptoms and through feeling. And I had, to be honest with you, I had all of that leading up to the stroke. But because I was so in the dark about about the whole idea of stroke and mm. it, it sort of hit me from the from the left field because nobody in my family, I'm the first in my family to have had a stroke. 
Mm. So nobody in my family had it. So I did not have any contacts. I didn't have anybody sort of uh, ringing the ringing the alarm to say, you've got to be careful or you mm-hmm. better check this out because, you know, you're predisposed to this. None of that. So uh, sorry to cut over you. I suppose in your case okay. as well. You know, you were you were ticking the boxes, so to speak, as in going to the gym, being healthy, not overweight. Mm-hmm. So again, mm-hmm. that that picture of health on the outside, mm-hmm. you had ticked all of those. So I suppose it, it made logical sense that you didn't really know signs or pay heed to them. Right. And, you know, to be honest with you and nothing against the allopathic community from that perspective, because my advice to anybody, if you do feel like you're in the position of having a stroke and you check off the boxes of what is actually unfolding, massive headaches, like slurred speech, things Mm -hmm. of that nature, please go to the hospital. It's important that you get, I I really am a big believer of emergency health Mm -hmm. uh, and emergency medicine, very important. But the actual post care when you go home, that's, that's in your hands. And that's basically how my journey unfolded. But regenerative detoxification came to me because like I said, by all accounts, allopathic never found anything wrong with me. I was actually Mm -hmm. the epitome of health. And even when I used to go to the doctor and I used to do diligently, I would go to my doctor, my family doctor, an allopathic at that time. I don't anymore. And I would get all the blood work done, my annual physical, you name it. And I remember my doctor once told me that I am her most exemplary patient. (laughs) So my, yeah, my blood work was Mm -hmm. amazing. So I would walk out of there on a cloud nine because I thought I'm like I am and of course it fueled me I'm like of course great you know I need to continue to run I need to continue to work out and what I'm doing is right and blah 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 but once I started doing my research I realized that you know what they do they take these numbers that they measure against for blood work when you do blood work and these uh, these numbers come from very average people who are not necessarily the epitome of health They're just average people that the allopathic community sees. And as an aside, allopathic, I look at as a sort of disease management system because they just help you manage. So these people that they use the numbers from are not people that are at the top of their health game. So, of course, by all accounts, my numbers looked amazing against theirs. So that's Mm -hmm. why I'm so exemplary. But not so exemplary that I'm uh, immune from a stroke. Yeah. So... Uh, regenerative detoxification came in as the missing piece of the puzzle because I realized that despite all my efforts and like I said I was I was a runner and the gym was sort of my at the top of my priority list for my health my diet was not optimal because I had this feeling that I can eat anything because I could erase all my sins Mm -hmm. when I got to the gym Mm -hmm. and that's actually in that industry you will see a lot of people who who eat a lot because they feel that they can they can get away with it because they they work out but the damage that's done at cellular level and that's where regenerative detoxification came in because that's where i learned the most from a meta perspective you understand that you know calories in calories out you burn them you use them you your body uses them for its functions yada 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 yes of course that happens but what kind of an impact does what you ingest have on your organs, on your Mm. tissues, on your cells. And that's what I didn't know. So when I stumbled upon regenerative detoxification, and God bless Dr. Morse, my God, this man is a genius beyond anything that is humanly possible. And I was turned to him by my best friend. And I have to, as an aside, I have to even say a little bit about her. She was at the hospital with me sitting on my bed with me every night after long days of work. So she she works in the corporate world. So she had very long hours and she would come after work. She would stop by the hospital and she would sit with me and she would strategize because she's a very strategic person. <laughs> yeah, that's why she has such success in the corporate world. She she would strategize ways for me to heal. Like mm. from in that perspective, in that moment, uh, one of the one of the side effects of my stroke was actually my inability to to speak. Like I could not come up with mm. words. My sentences were all they would not make any sense. Like if I was to say to you right now, uh, hi, Karen, how are you? I would probably say, hi, you are Karen. Like mm, the words yeah. would not be following a proper structure. So that that's called aphasia. 
And she would strategize how to get me to improve that. And wow. I also had lost a lot of my vocabulary. I had lost massive amounts of, of words that I would look at. I remember my neurologist came one day and she, she held a pen in front of me and she said, what's this? And in my mind, I kept, my mind was screaming to me, it's a pen, it's a pen. But I could not. I don't know which side of my brain was telling me that or which side of my mind because I could not verbalize it. I was mm -hmm. like, uh, and I could not ex express myself. So my best friend would come to the hospital and she would try to help me get through this whole process. So she would try to strategize. She was trying to say, okay, because if your mind can think, then why don't you write down all the words that you can't remember? But I was mm -hmm. like, uh, how am I going to do this? But anyway, so she's the one who, out of the goodness of her heart, she was actually on her own health journey. And I'm sure she probably did a whole bunch of research. So she turned me on to Dr. Morse. And Dr. Morse is the regenerative detoxification guru. Um, so I turned to him too. And that's when I started. And I remember, I kid you not, Karen, it was that day, right after I figured out I was already home trying to, to get better, I remember it was that day that I changed everything. Like I threw stuff out of the fridge instantly. Like I said, okay, I'm never going to eat that again. I'm never going to eat that again. So that's how I started. I started by changing my diet and very, very quickly my body yeah. responded. Incredible. And what a, what a super friend as well too. And that's often, <laughs> she is. Yeah, that's often how things come in. You know, someone will mention something, we'll see something in a magazine or overhear it. But again, it's us who needs to take the action because easily you could have been like, oh, no, sounds a bit crazy or how can that work? You know, so that's that's really empowering as well. And then, yes, if you have the desire, you attract it. it yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. <laughs> so then what happened then when you, well, you said your body responded very quickly, but what kind of things were you doing? How was the detoxification process for you? Oh, so uh, like I said, the first step was that I, I completely stopped. It was sort of like, uh, if I can just give somebody uh, a comparison is it's imagine like you're trying to quit smoking and you quit cold turkey. That's what I did. Like mm -hmm. I actually quit things that were that I had been eating up until that point. I quit them like literally. Like cold what? Turkey. What kind of examples? Like, like meat, for example. Mm -hmm. So nothing animal anymore. Because part of the re regenerative detoxification, uh, what it teaches you is that the plant kingdom has in it many things that the body uses for its cleansing for its nourishing for its hydration so if you were to look at let's say an apple it has over a hundred nutrients in it mm -hmm. it has uh the juice in it is actually hydrating it has vitamins it has mm -hmm. minerals it has essential fatty acids it has amino acids so it has all the structures that the body needs to build and to repair. Whereas when you look at things like that we get from animals, if you look, for example, at meat, first of all, it's dead. Mm -hmm. So it's not an alive thing anymore. So the idea, and when I looked at it, I was like, how did I not know this? The idea that you take something in that's dead and try to give yourself life, it's incongruent. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't match, right? So the idea of taking something that's dead to give yourself life or to, to fuel your body your body doesn't know. And I could go into deeper detail, even as far as the protein myth, which everybody, of course, asks me about. The body actually is who or what builds protein. You mm -hmm. don't get it straight from, from meat. And even if you do get protein from meat, what the body actually does after you've ingested it, it takes it, it breaks it down. It uses what it needs because everybody is very biochemically unique. So my unique biochemical makeup is very different than your unique biochemical makeup. Mm -hmm. Even at the protein level, let's say I'm about 5'7", 120 pounds, and let's say you're you know, 5'10", and you weigh 160 pounds. Your requirements are vastly different than mine. Mm -hmm. um, and because you're probably from a different ethnicity, you probably have unique needs that your body requires than mine. So the idea that we all have to eat across the board, you know, eat beef, eat this, eat that, is very much akin to what the allopathic was doing with me. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a stroke is equal to you need protein. So here, take these meds and 
on the other hand here eat this meat but that's not how it works because the body actually has very unique needs and and the body knows what imbalances it has like if you come with anything deficient from like hereditary wise then it knows to look for specific things to address that particular gap so so you don't need to eat what everybody else needs to eat for its needs so that was the first thing i dropped animal i dropped this when i was telling you that i found such a drastic thing I dropped dairy. I mean, I loved, <laughs> and I mean loved is not even the word to use. I loved yogurt, and I was eating copious amounts of it. Wow. And of course, in the name of protein, and it tasted good. But to be honest with you, actually, I found that I was listening to myself. I was One day, I was listening to my voicemail uh, when, I, when I went in to check it, and I could hear that I sounded so nasal, mm-hmm. like congested, constant congestion. Yeah. So one of the lessons that I learned in re- regenerative detoxification is that dairy is actually very congestive and it actually leads to tumors. So I thought to myself, hmm, let's see what happens if I was to actually drop this. And it was I had to be very disciplined and focused. And I did. And I kid you not, within three months, when I listened to myself on my voicemail again, my greeting, I was like, oh, my God. I don't sound as nasally anymore. Mm. And then the more I like more forward I went, I could see that it it cleared more and more and more. And again, I did not have the same, you know, shortness of breath, inability to do certain things. And I used to have constant sinus infections, which, of course, the sinus, the sinuses were the ones that were congested from all the, the dairy consumption. And even that disappeared. So that's what I mean. But I had to be very self-aware because every day I would have a, a journal and I would journal like, this is how I feel. I'm not bloated. I'm not feeling this. I'm not feeling drowsy. So I instantly saw the changes as soon as I introduced the things. The body was probably applauding and saying, yeah. thank you, Simone. Finally, thank you. finally. Yes, yes. She is feeding me what I need. What I need. Exactly. Oh, exactly. it's. It's so true. And like, yeah, you know, like you say, the the ability of the body to respond so quickly, but it takes the persistence, the consistency. It's not enough to do it once, that dedication, that discipline. But then the, the body responds so quickly. And I know even when I was on my journey and just making conscious shifts, it wasn't like I was trying to eliminate anything per se. I was just, I was becoming more aware and in tune of my body. And like mm-hmm. you said, that dead food, once I, really was in tune with my body. I was like, I'm a living organism. This dead food exactly. makes me feel dead. I feel sluggish. Exactly. I feel heavy. It feels dense in my body. Whereas mm-hmm. then when you're eating from like the plant kingdom like that, I literally feel alive, like I'm buzzing. It's and, you true. know, like you say, because there's just so hundreds and hundreds of nutrients and phytonutrients and things that our body needs. So, and you know, life in a way that I because I had to explain a lot of the times when I work with people that they ask, well, how, how is this alive? I mean, like, you know, it came from a tree and it's not on the tree anymore. I said, yes, but what was in the tree, the life of the tree is still left inside the actual fruit that it bears. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's encapsulated in there for you to open it. And that's mostly how, like, if you look at fruits, bananas or anything, they come like with a peel, everything is contained within there for you to open and enjoy all those benefits. Whereas if you're going to be taking an animal and you kill it, and you drain it of its life force, I mean, blood, for example, is it contains the life force of the body, but you can't drink its blood and you can't eat it raw. So you go and you kill it even more by exposing it to heat through the cooking process. And right now you're you're left with something that has absolutely no energy. And I could go deeper into this because when I work with patients, I try to show them the amount of energy and at what frequency it vibrates. And there are actually visuals that I bring to show them. Here's a fruit and here's, let's say, a piece of meat that's been cooked. Or you can actually, there are machines that actually show with voltage how much is in a fruit so there was this one test that's actually i believe on youtube they open a a lemon and they attach this these electrodes to it so that it can actually measure how much is in that lemon and the lemon is just sitting there cut nothing's been done to it and then they do the same with with a fruit that's been cooked and you could see that that barely moves and then they do an additional test where they actually attach a light bulb so when they put it on the lemon, you see that the light bulb lights up mm-hmm. and then they put it on the meat and you see that the light bulb doesn't come on. So it's like, OK, that's a really good visual for people to see what what kind of energy does it bring into your body to sustain and support life? 
Yeah, totally. And I love you mentioned earlier as well that, you know, everyone has a different makeup biochemically and even energetically, physiologically in every sense. So then how can people start this journey? Because again, you know, it's not a, a broad brush stroke of bananas are good for everyone either, because some people, again, it may not be the best option for them. I mean, generally, mm-hmm. yes, I think we can all say fruit and vegetables, you can't go wrong. But there is that thing as well as there might be certain things within us that it mightn't align with. So how can people start to make better choices for themselves? Like, are there practical tips or tools that you can share with people that can begin this kind of self-aware journey? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, from a broad perspective, uh, some of the things that we consume on a regular basis are the things that we could see that have not been towards our benefit, but have rather been towards our detriment. And dairy in particular, for example, so people who consume dairy, that would be the number one thing that I would recommend that people remove from their diet completely. And I know that it's difficult, Mm -hmm. but I just want to explain exactly why because it's important that people look at it from a different perspective that's not always available in the mainstream media, and it's not available to our doctors, and God bless doctors, but they they don't have any nutrition training in medical school, so they don't have the ability to sort of talk about things at that level. So first and foremost, I want to say that eating is something we do every day, multiple times a day. We should be fasting a couple of days here and there, but that's not something that we've been taught to do. Uh, So for on average, most individuals eat every day and they do so multiple times a day. When you take something into the body, it has to be for what the body needs, just like you said, for for obvious purposes that were so uniquely constructed from different backgrounds, different cultures, different ethnicities. But for example, when we look at the milk of another species, so let's let's take cow milk, for example, which is the most predominant thing, especially here in North America, we have something that if you study the nutritional profile, it's actually designed to support the growth of an animal that grows to be on average between 15 to 2,000 pounds, 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. So clearly the nutrients available in the milk, the most important time that we should have milk is for the newborn because that's when they don't have a developed Mm. enough digestive system to be able to break anything else down. So all the nutrients are found in the milk. And if you look at all species on our planet, you will see that animals produce milk for the young. And then once the young have become self-sufficient, they no longer drink milk. And in Mm -hmm. fact, if you look even at us humans, we no longer produce milk past Mm -hmm. a certain time. And the body and its infinite intelligence actually stops producing enzymes that break down the milk for obvious reasons, because past a certain age, it's no longer required. Mm. And if you look at the nutritional profile of uh, cow milk versus human milk, you will see that it's vastly different. And the the obvious reason is because the human body reaches, and I'm going to talk, let's say, average for a grown, full-grown man, let's say 200 pounds, and I'm Mm -hmm. being very generous here. The nutritional profile for a cow fully grown at its maximum size is about 2000 and they have completely different biochemical makeup in their body so their milk supports them our milk supports us Mm -hmm. so to eat anything that is made or to drink we eat when i say eat is because we produce cheese and yogurts and all of that so to eat or to put to ingest anything that the nutritional profile is made to support the growth and development of a 2,000 pound animal that has completely different digestive system, completely different genetic makeup, a completely different consciousness, a completely different brain that does not have the ability to reason to the same level that we do. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that would be for obvious reasons when you see it that way. And this is, of course, something I learned through regenerative detoxification. Do not consume something that's made for somebody else that has a completely different genetic makeup than you. So from a species perspective, we should not consume something that is made for another species. And the same thing goes for eggs and the same thing goes for the meat and so on and so forth. Because if you really look at it, and I know I'm probably stating the obvious, if you look at animals, they eat what's made for them. 
They will mm-hmm. never gravitate. They don't have the ability to reason to say, I'm going to eat this today. They just naturally and intuitively are driven to eat only what they know and they don't go to choose. It, they just naturally mm-hmm. gravitate towards what's good for them. So you'll never see a squirrel going to eat, you know, meat. Yeah. It'll go looking for for the things that are good for it. And it's, you will never see a, a squirrel that that gets cancer. You'll never see a squirrel that gets overweight or obese or malnourished or anything like that because it always it knows what to go for so Mm -hmm. we have to eat within the constraints of what actually supports our body to remain clean vibrating at the frequency it's supposed to be supported towards its healing mechanisms and be able to be nourished so that it can sustain physical activity reasoning things of that nature and and to be honest with you if you go in deeper into this even meat for example from a psycho spiritual and vibration perspective these poor animals before they're slaughtered they feel immense amount of fear mm. and an immense amount of sadness and rage uh, because they're not able to protect themselves and all of that produces certain biochemical things in the body that gets released into the bloodstream that feeds all the muscles and all the tissues that we eat yeah. so all of that the the um, intense amounts of adrenaline and their fear the the vibration of fear the energy of fear the energy of rage is embedded into that into their tissues that we take into the body so if you're going to take in that kind of adrenaline it'll stimulate you and then that in in, in turn creates this domino effect into our body if you're going to be so overly stimulated the body's going to say oh i'm out of balance let me mobilize things that's going to kind of depress things to bring them down so you now are affecting all your your chemistry all your natural processes that the body relies on to be at homeostasis or in balance so um you have to be very attuned and very self-aware so the, the first step that I would say people have to sort of listen to their body to see how do I feel when I when I take this and how do yeah. I feel after I eat it? How do I feel two days later after I eat it? Because if you cumulatively do something, you kind of start to see patterns that every time I eat sugar, I feel really hyper and then I crash. Or like I was telling you about my consumption, my copious consumption of dairy, I would eat and then I, I was constantly congested, constant, like I, I used to, my throat used to get infected all the time. My, I used to get these massive sinus infections all the time. So I would be running to the doctor and getting all kinds of antibiotics, despite my stellar blood work results. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so those kind of things would be the first the first step. So I would say, you know, listen to your body always. There's such an amazing communication system with the body. And if you were to listen and pay attention, it'll tell you everything you need to do. Mm. So true. And what a powerful analogy there as well with the dairy. And that is it really. You know, again, it's like you even described in your story, like the the misleading information of, well, when we look X, Y and Z or we're doing X, Y and Z that are deemed healthy, well, then we don't have any issues. But again, it's really listening to the internal whispers and nudges that are trying to get our attention to let us know. So I love, you know, just asking those questions. And you mentioned it as well. For for months, you did a self-awareness process. You journaled on how you were feeling, you know, after you eat things and that's literally something we can all do and but the thing like everything it is we have to do it and people are like oh but it's boring or it's annoying but it's it's really yeah but it's really magic because what we can potentially save ourselves from down the line I mean that's worth everything it is our health at the end of the day like you say you know I believe as well western medicine allopathic medicine it's interventional it is not designed for lifestyle issues for chronic issues it is just an Mm. acute system which is really powerful in acute situations but the reality is that heart disease stroke cancer they're lifestyle issues they're chronic issues they build over years and years because of habits we're doing so again it's how do we reverse them getting in that detoxification coming back to life-giving foods that support us and sustain us and something you mentioned before and I know we're running out of time and we didn't even get onto a list of cancer but I can only imagine everything that we've spoken about is applicable as well to it and 
I lost my dad to cancer and I can totally see and I went on a deep dive research after that because again the only solutions were chemo radiation surgery like now 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 the minute he was diagnosed and even he was like oh maybe I've heard about carrot juice before and even he wanted to explore other things but there was just this fear of having no time like there was absolutely no time this has been diagnosed it needs to come out in x y and z and yes in some cases it can be very severe if it's on the brain but usually you have time you know another week is not going to make a difference in the grand scheme of things like he had a stage four tumor which I learned you know that's growing for between eight and 15 years usually before it can show up so another week is not going to do anything so it's coming out of the fear of this but one aspect as well that I think is hugely important when it comes to any kind of healing and taking ownership of our lives that you mentioned as well you took that accountability it is the mindset aspect and what did you do as well in your journey to really help you shift your mindset? Uh, I'm, I'm just as an aside, and I will definitely talk to you about what made me shift my mindset. But I just wanted to really commend you for, for bringing that up about the cancer, because yes, absolutely. And regenerative detoxification goes the same way. If it takes something eight to 15 years to grow, you cannot expect that something mm-hmm. will heal it within, you know, Overnight. a month or a week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that the healing journey back will be in the same way, lengthy, but worth it. Because mm-hmm. what you get at the end is you get your health back. Yeah. Totally. Your health, your vitality. And without having to suffer in the in the process. Yeah. Like you do, for example, when you see in cancer, uh, when patients go the chemo and radiation route and they, they get emaciated, they lose their mm-hmm. hair, they have no, like the quality of life is significantly reduced. Yeah. So you don't have any of those things with, uh, with regenerative detoxification. So if people are apt to uh, withstand all those things through the allopathic therapies, then definitely they they should be able to look at it to say there's so much more to gain going the natural way. Mm-hmm. Um, and to get back to, to your question, the whole self-awareness and mindset thing, actually the, the thing that really was the catalyst, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, was this really deep desire to not die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, you know what, I have kids. I have so much more. There were so many things that I wanted to achieve. And I wanted to to mention that I'm writing a book right now. There were many things on the horizon for me that I wanted to. I had dreams and, and goals that I wanted to make sure that I bring to fruition here uh, in the physical in the physical realm. So mm-hmm. I, did, I wasn't ready to go. So I had this, this deep desire. But at the same time, it was also like, no, it shouldn't be like this. Intuitively, I felt that when you're healing, it sh- you should not be suffering. And that life is not about suffering. I enjoyed feeling great. Like I was telling you, I was running and working out and I love that. And I thought there's never any need to suffer ever. Mm -hmm. And I will, I categorically refuse to accept and I demand of myself to feel better. So I was very driven to that. So my mindset was that of desire for being okay for my children, for myself, for the achievement of my goals for wanting to be here. I mean, the thought of like my mother having to bury her mm. child, that there's probably no greater thing. So I even, even the idea that of what it would do, I would devastate my family. Yeah. So those things are my driving factors. And also my deep desire to know that, you know, there's actually a better way and I'm not done here. I'm here to fulfill so many things yeah. and I'm going to. So I, I made that decision. This desire and decision are very powerful. Yeah. So powerful. I mean, if you can connect with that deep desire not to die, you can do anything. You can move mountains. But so again, true. it that takes for us, you know, a lot of people just accept the prognosis. They're like, oh, no, I've been given six months. Oh, no, I better make the most of my last time. Where it's like you can take that information, like you say, you can des- decide something different. And when we decide something different, more powerful, the universe will conspire to support us. But again, we have to show up as well. We have to take the action. We have to follow the intuitive nudges that will support us on that journey, which is not always the the done thing, as in it's not always the prescribed Western medical model, because again, they're treating symptoms, they're not getting to the root issues either. So I love that. And I love how you say you've no reason to suffer. And that's true. And You know, Mm -hmm. pain is a part of life. We'll all go through pain and challenges and difficulties and loss and grief. And that is 100% part of life. But suffering is optional. Suffering is us 
thought too. adding arms and legs and sitting in that dwelling in it like we have to feel everything to process it but then when we dwell and it becomes our identity we are we are choosing our own suffering so pain is inevitable in life suffering i totally believe as well is optional and yes. again it's that accountability it's that desire like you mentioned as well for something better for ourselves and we have to build that inner resilience and keep going and strive for something better which encapsulates everything in that whole holistic approach and mm-hmm. what a fantastic conversation and just as a last question as well I'm interested to know for what sure. your daily practices are or tools that still help you just feeling healthy and good yeah so actually thank you so much for for asking that because that's very powerful for to be able to at least maintain or perpetuate your health, mm-hmm. you have to you have to employ certain things. So for me, what I do, uh, I'm a very early riser. I get up very early because I I really want to be able to take the most that I can out of the day. So I meditate. I journal because it's amazing how powerful the imagination is when you journal. It comes up with incredible things that just make you stop. And, and then when you take action on those things, you new worlds open up to you. Yeah. Um, I also continue to work out. There are days that I just do some yoga stretches because my muscles need it. And then there are days that I do more intense workouts to get the blood moving. And uh, I, I'm very strict with what I eat because I really enjoy how I feel. And exactly like you said earlier, this feeling of lightness, I'm very quick on my feet. I don't feel sluggish. My mind is very sharp. So basically what you put into your body, you will see manifestation of it Mm. in your reality. So uh, all those things, my mornings are the most sacred and important to me because that's how I start. And it sort of sets the tone for the rest of the day. And I feel that energy. I'm not on any medication. I look really great. I feel really great. I feel really strong. I feel like I have a full zest of life. I love to learn new things. I'm able to actually run after my kids and we do crazy things like we (laughs) wrestle, things like that. So um, that's another important thing, play and be a kid. But the most important thing, if I was to say anything to anybody, is really work on the mindset, like refuse to accept any other outcome other than the one that you want. And it should always be that you want to be healthy, you want to be be vibrant, that you want longevity, and you Mm -hmm. want the zest of life. Because what you said earlier, uh, actually, I wanted to touch on that quickly, Karen. When doctors, and there's scientific proof of this, because I told you I had the time when I did the research on my journey, there are actual cases that you can find where people have died because they had a cancer diagnosis where doctors said, and again, just like it happened with me in allopathic, it's like a catch-all kind of approach under the same umbrella. You have this cancer, you have X amount of time to live. Mm-hmm. And the person dies within that time frame because they accepted that as truth and it, it was so deeply driven into their belief system and into their subconscious. And then when they did the autopsy, the person actually did not even have cancer. There was no yeah. trace of cancer found in the body. So just think of how powerful the mind is once you accept something it actually your body just moves into action to make it manifest yeah what a fantastic message to end on as well and yeah so true the power of belief and you're a testament to what is possible when we connect to that desire and we truly believe in our hearts that something is better and more vibrant and available to us it will happen It will happen. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. And please share before we just part ways as well of where people can find out more on your amazing work. Before I say that, I just wanted to thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate and I'm honored to share my story and to be able to provide value. Uh, I'm very grateful to you for having me on your show. So people can find me. The the first place I would say is my website, simonegisondi.com. And I, it sort of lays out exactly all the services that I offer. Uh, there is a way to get access to me. But if you need to send me an email, I'm at Simone at SimoneGisondi.com. 
or you can Google Jisandi Health Consulting and know that it's all holistic, all natural, holistic cancer, regenerative detoxification, the path to superior health. So yeah, and also you can find me on Facebook uh, as well as Instagram. Love it. Thank you so much. And the pleasure was all mine as well for having you join today. And just thank you. And I wish you continued vibrancy and health and vitality. And to you as well. Thank you again, Karen. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you get notified every time a new show is released. Get more information on this week's guest as well on my website www.soulpowerlight.com.